Johnson is the former chairman of Overstock.com. He also ran for governor in the state of Utah in 2016. Presently, he is the president of Medici Ventures, which is one of the leading investors in blockchain technology. So this is a guy with a lot of experience who sees the implications of blockchain and what the future of it is going to be and what it means to you. So enjoy my interview with Jonathan Johnson. Jonathan, thanks so much for taking your time today to have this conversation. You bet, Patrick. My pleasure. So we're here at Overstock.com headquarters. Yeah. And uh, you've been on the board here for how long? About six years. About six years. Yeah. Now, uh, let's, I guess, start back maybe about your career and kind of educational background, and then I want to talk about how we got here. Sure. So uh, what did you study in school? Uh, I studied Japanese in school. Japanese? Yeah. What prompted that? Uh, well, I'd, I'd been a Mormon missionary in Japan, came mm -hmm. back, liked it. I uh, actually went back, studied in Japan as a government of, uh, Japanese government scholar. Okay. Came back, went to law school, uh, and then practiced law for a number of years before joining Overstock uh, in 2002. Did you have a, a thought about a, you know, international business or, or anything like that when you were studying Japanese? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, it was the, it was the 80s. Uh, Japan's economy was booming. Um, and when I practiced law in Los Angeles, almost all my clients were Japanese companies that were buying or selling and doing business here in the, in the U.S. So uh, what brought you back to uh, Utah, or what brought you to Utah from California? Well, uh, I came to Utah to join a software company as its general counsel. It was the uh, late 90s, and the Internet bubble was getting big, and uh, I joined a software company as their general counsel. Uh, it was a great opportunity and a great place to raise a family. Yeah. So, uh, and then you came on the board of Overstock. Well, I came to Overstock first, uh, boy, 16 and a half years ago as its general counsel. Okay. Uh, and I've had a lot of different positions at Overstock. I was the general counsel. I wore a bunch of business hats. I was the president of the company for five years. Uh, I was the acting CEO when our founder, Patrick, got sick for a time. Thankfully, he got better. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, when he came back, uh, I moved to the board and took a less active day-to-day -day role for a short period. So, uh, and let's talk about, I think, this uh, this less active role because uh, you ran for governor in the state of Utah. I did. And, I did. and came this close. <laughs> well, it depends how you, how you slice and dice it. You know, we have got a different system here in Utah where there's a party nominating convention, and if you can get 60% of that convention, you avoid a primary. If you get more than 40 but less than 60, you're in a primary with a competitor. I did very well in the convention and did come that close in the convention. And then in the primary, uh, lost handily. Yeah. Anyway, that's how it was. Yeah, so uh, what, what prompted you to want to run for governor? Well, you know, I really haven't had a political bone in my body. Uh, but my view is we do better as a society when we elect people that are successful leaders mm -hmm. into positions, political positions. Right. Uh, I also think we need turnover. Mm -hmm. uh, and the governor of Utah at the time had finished two terms, was running for a third term, uh, wasn't really a businessman, right. uh, didn't have that background. Uh, and I thought well, there was a lot of things where we could use what I learned in business at Overstock and elsewhere to run the government more efficiently, solve problems. Uh, push decisions down to local entities and parents and families and individuals. Right. That was kind of the platform that I ran on. And uh, it was a fun thing to do. It was an exciting thing to do. Unfortunately, it was not a successful thing to do. Yeah, but maybe fortunately, because now you are in charge uh, here of a division of our stock called Medici uh, Ventures. What's that about? So just to kind of walk how I, after I, you know, lost in the campaign. I was still on the Overstock board and mm -hmm. you didn't know what was next for me. And I came to the next board meeting and toward the end of the meeting, the board asked me to step out and then brought me back in and said, you know, we've got this blockchain business. It's mm -hmm. really new. It's nascent. And it's kind of wrapped around the axle. Mm -hmm. We know you're good at startups. We know you understand the law. You understand business. Would you be interested in running our blockchain business? Something we call Medici. Mm -hmm. And I said, boy, that sounds like a lot of fun. And so uh, that's what I've been doing for the past two and a half years. And our goal at, at Medici is to 
advance blockchain technology by investing in companies that are using blockchain technology to get rid of middlemen, mm -hmm. uh, to um, rehumanize commerce, uh, and to just do things more efficiently with what we think is going to be technology that's more revolutionary than the internet has been. So, a big statement, it's more revolutionary than the internet. So, yeah. if you're taking someone who doesn't really understand blockchain, they hear the term a lot, they mm -hmm. kind of equate it to cryptocurrency and it knows there's some relationship there. How would you explain uh, blockchain to the layperson? Well, a couple ways. First, I'd say Bitcoin is to blockchain mm -hmm. like email was to the internet. It's kind of the first killer app, is right. what we'd say today. You know, when I was freshman in college and got my first email mm -hmm. on CompuServe, I thought, wow, that's the internet. Right. Well, it was, but mm -hmm. it wasn't. The internet's turned out to be so much more. It's, right. The internet's been a way for us to transfer information freely and frictionlessly, uh, really easily around the globe. Mm -hmm. uh, blockchain lets us do the same with assets. Mm -hmm. And I, I use the air quotes for assets because Anything is that when I give to you, you don't want a copy of, mm -hmm. I would call an asset. Mm -hmm. That could be cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. It could be uh, another kind of digital currency. It could be a property right. Mm -hmm. It could be my vote. Mm -hmm. Something that when I spend it or give it to you, you don't want me to be able to double spend it by giving you a copy and someone else a copy. Right. Interesting, because uh, there would be applications uh, for the blockchain as far as voting is concerned, because voter fraud is, seems to be in the headlines a lot. Uh, we're happen to be right now in an election cycle, and a lot of people are talking about you know rights to vote and you know people voting inappropriately or double voting like you're talking mm -hmm. about. So do you see a future for that in blockchain? Absolutely. In fact, Magic Ventures has two portfolio companies that are using uh, blockchain in voting. One, a company called Votes, which is spelled V-O-A-T-Z, mm -hmm. is being used by West Virginia right now in the election in November 2018. No, so it's already an application? Already an application. Wow. And what they're, what they're doing in West Virginia is they're limiting its use to people that are overseas, so military mm -hmm. personnel and their families, other people that are overseas, historically have about a 10% voter participation uh, you know, rate. And it's difficult for them to vote. They might be in some godforsaken place defending our country. They've got to have a fax or an email mm -hmm. or something difficult to send it in. Votes has developed a blockchain-based application you download on your phone. You put in who you are with biometrics, whether it's your thumbprint or facial recognition. The county clerk in West Virginia sees that you are you, mm -hmm. that you are registered in that county. They feed you a ballot electronically on your smartphone. You vote. It gets cryptographically securely put into the blockchain. You submit it, and it comes back to the county clerk. The county clerk doesn't know that it was you that voted, so it's still a secret vote, mm -hmm. but it knows that it was someone that was registered and allowed to vote, right. it then creates a paper ballot that the clerk can use to audit. But it makes voting so much easier far away. Right. And frankly, I think the best thing about this application is that if I'm the voter who's used, this they used the application on the phone, mm -hmm. after I voted, I can go in and using my key, see that my vote was counted Oh, so As it, cast. it follows it down the chain. I can yeah. audit wow. my vote.